Hello, dear listener. Welcome to the Future Seeds podcast. I'm your host, Cyprian. And in this show, I explore groundbreaking solutions to our world's unique problems by connecting seemingly unrelated fields such as technology, ecology, community, and spirituality. In this episode, I interviewed Dorset Campbell Ross. Dorset is a counselor certified in nonviolent communication. He's also an NLP master practitioner and hypnotherapist, codependency lecturer, seminar leader, and mediator. He has also conducted business and personal relationship trainings all around the world and has mediated between groups of people in conflict in Ireland, Indonesia, and Australia. In this conversation, we explore the deep meaning of nonviolence and the four steps of NVC, namely observation, feelings, needs, and requests. We also explain how one expresses himself honestly, the importance of our choice of words, and the purpose of healthy communication. Dear listeners, it's not always easy to get clear on what we can actually do to help this world, how we can impact. This is why I've created a cheat sheet, your 10 superpowers to change the world right now. You can download it on www.futurecs.news slash superpowers. You're an expert in nonviolent communication. Mm-hmm. You were, from what I understand, one of the first ones certified and trained here in Australia and even met up with the father of nonviolent communication, Marshall Rosenberg. You want to tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Yeah, I met him in 1999 and uh, in London. I went to a, um, well, actually south of London, I went to a mediation workshop that he gave. And that was kind of my introduction to NBC. In order to go to that, I had to do a foundation training first with Bridget Belgrave and Gina Laurie, who are a couple of certified trainers in England. I went to that mediation training. I was very impressed, but I also thought it was kind of above my level of expertise. Uh, What we were learning was pretty advanced stuff. Um, But some of it penetrated my grey matter because a couple of years later I was able to do a mediation based on that workshop alone, which stunned the hell out of me because it actually worked. And I did this mediation between African refugees and uh, Irish volunteers who were supposed to be helping the refugees, but actually they all fell out with each other. And um, Right. Where was that? Was it in Africa? No, that was in Ireland, in Kilkenny. And uh, so a woman who lived in the town came and asked me for their help, for asked me to help because she knew I was a mediator. Well, she knew that I'd done this course in mediation that I liked very much. Uh, it was actually the very first time I tried it out, you know, the skills of MVC mediation. And um, so I did, uh, because I was a beginner, I just, I said, I can't do groups. I can only do a mediation between two people. So if you can round up the leaders, bring the two leaders and I'll give it my best shot, you know. So I did. And uh, they brought these two leaders together. Uh, quite an quite a interesting couple because the, uh, the African was about six foot ten. Uh, huge massive huge hands really big but twice as big as mine and you know completely shaven head and this big impressive shiny very impressive and he was a prince or a king in africa uh, he had been and uh, so he was the natural born leader of this 40 african um african refugees and then the, the Irish guy was a little guy. He was a little red-headed guy who was about four foot six. And, um, you know, quite... Feisty. Feisty, yes. And uh, so they, they, were, they both came in and the, and the Africans sort of looked down at this fellow like he was <laughs> something that just crawled out of the sewer. And, uh, and the little guy was looking up at him like, come on, give me your best shot, you know. And they, they really didn't like each other. In fact, when they sat down at the table, they both faced outwards so they didn't have to see each other. And um, so I went through the mediation using those very basic instructions that I'd learned from Marshall. How and, long ago you know, was that? Oh, that was in uh, 2002. And right. uh, yeah, uh, I, you know, you listen to one person you get the other person to reflect back what they heard this one heard, what, the, what this one said, and then you go to the other person, you listen to them, and you get this guy to reflect back what that person said, 
which sounds very easy, doesn't it? Except that what happens is when this person starts talking, this one interrupts immediately. <laughs> and so you have to keep asking this one nicely to wait for their turn to speak. Oh, even so, yeah. during mediation, people do that. Oh, yeah, very much so. Because they're all hot under the collar and full of attack and defense, you know. So, uh, yeah, I, it took uh, three days, I think, yes. Oh, no, two days, just two days. Two, lot, two sessions of two hours. Because I, my attention span is, you know, to stay really present for people for more than two hours is, is, was, was my limit at that time. So, um, so what was the result? The result was overwhelmingly wonderful. You know, they, uh, they reconciled their differences and agreed to work with each other again. And everybody... Actually, they were so impressed by the mediation that they said, how did I do that? In fact, the African guy would ask me if it was juju, you know, if it was some sort of magic <laughs> that I did on him. And I said, no, it's just this stuff, nonviolent communication. And I he said, have said yes. <laughs> well, he said, nonviolent communication. And he slammed the table with his fist. He said, my people must learn this. And the little Irish guy <laughs> said, and my people must learn this too. You know, so... Um, <laughs> Can you give us a workshop tomorrow? <laughs> it was Friday and he said, you know, we're free tomorrow, tomorrow afternoon. Can you give us a workshop? And I was like, well, I've never given a workshop before, but, you know, this seems like such a golden opportunity. So I said, yes, okay. And then I got on the phone that night to my mentor in England, you know, and I said, they've asked me to do a workshop. What shall I do? What shall I do? And she said, well, how long is the workshop? I said, well, it's about three hours, four hours in the afternoon. It's just an afternoon. And she said, we can't do everything in an afternoon. So just do a bit. Do this little bit. Do a bit of expressing honestly and maybe a bit of empathy. So I said, well, that's quite a bit, but okay, I'll do that. So she gave me a few exercises. And the next day I had 25 Africans and 25 Irishmen all in the same room. And these were the guys who'd been fighting. And they'd all put their weapons down and agreed to learn how to live together in peace. How come? Was that because the, the leader said, you need to do this? Exactly, because their yeah. leader said so. And then afterwards, when I finished the workshop, this little guy from the back of the room came up, who I'd never seen before, an Irishman. And he, wa he, wa he came up as everybody else was leaving. And he said, excuse me. He says, um, I'd really like to buy you a drink. You care for a Guinness? And I was like, mm -hmm okay, yeah, I wouldn't mind a drink, you know, that'd be great. So we go across the road to the pub and he orders a couple of Guinness and uh, he comes over and he says, well, he says, you're probably wondering who I am. And I said, well, yeah, it had crossed my mind. And he said, I'm from the government. And I said, really? He says, yes, I was sent down from Dublin. I was sent down to sort out this mess and you beat me to it. He said, you've done my job for me <laughs> and I'm very grateful. He said, we heard about the violence. We heard that the Africans were threatening to, uh, you know, do violence in the town and all that. And we heard that some girls had been hurt and this. So they sent me down. I'm from the Refugee Council, which is part of the government. Mm. He says, you've done my job for me. He says, I'm so grateful. And I was sitting in on your workshop, a fantastic workshop, he said. So he said, um, look, I just want to pay you for your services rendered, he said. So uh, here, just send me the bill. Here's my card. Just like that, you know, and, uh, and that's, goodbye. That's amazing. See that, that's, yeah, how it was started, amazing. that's how you started that's how my, your career. That did start my career. And I actually went home that night and I said to my host, um, look, I told them what happened. I said, they asked me, well, how much should I charge them? I said, and she said, charge them like a wounded bull, <laughs> which is a play on words, you know, because, uh, you know, I mean, charge them like a wounded bull. They're the government. They've got more money than they know what to do with, you know. So, <laughs> so I charged them a thousand pound, and they paid it without even a blink, you know. That's Great. incredible. Uh, and since then, this is like almost twenty years ago. Since then, you, you now you consultant, a mediator. You do conflict resolution. Uh, you worked for uh, solving issues in business partnerships, relationships, communities. Mm. You traveled all around the world. You told me one of your yeah. big love is to to do intensive trainings in mm. Indonesia, yes, uh, in schools, right. yes. um, etc. But what would you say that in general that we're trying to achieve with quality communication? What is the outcome of communication in the end? Peace. Peace. Peace and love. Yeah. 
getting back to peace, well, returning to love, that's the way I, that's the words I use. Um, because when we're in a state of total trust and relaxed, then we feel peaceful. We've attained peace. And, and then what happens for me is that my heart opens and I feel love for everybody, including myself. And, uh, you know, this love is actually almost tangible. I can feel like a warmth spreading out in my chest and spreading around my body. So if we learn a way to communicate, which in this case you call non-violent communication, but if you learn a different way to communicate, it has an observable impact on our daily life if we use it daily in such a way that we actually feel different. Yeah, well, I, of course, because I, I, I mean, you know, I don't know about you, but most people feel pretty tense when they're having a conflict, right? <laughs> when they're having yeah. a conflict, we get, you know, we get probably frustrated and angry, first and foremost. Um, and that is a cover up for underneath fear and sadness. So, you know, if we can get below the anger, we'll find sadness and ultimately we'll find the fears. And, and really, it's quite simple. You, if you're in fear, you can't feel love. Your heart's closed. That's the definition of fear. You know, in fear, you're in survival mode and you're, going, you're hunkering down because, you know, you're something to be afraid of. You, you've decided out there. And you're either going to attack or defend or withdraw. And uh, so it's a tense place to be. Fear, you know, you can feel it in your gut, right? Your, your gut... Your stomach gets tight. That's the visceral feeling of fear, you know, as your stomach, your stomach gets tight. I also get tight in my throat. Um, Intuitively, I'm, I'm, guess, I'm guessing right now that when you start and get deeper into this type of work, you start realizing how many times a day you're having internal or external communication that's actually violent. Oh, yes. Well, you, you know... Uh, a lot of people ask, why do we call it non-violent communication? Because a lot of people say, well, I'm not violent, so I don't need that. <laughs> mm. um, but the thing is, Marshall Rosenberg chose that word non-violence. So he could align this teaching with the words and the actions of, and the teachings of Mahatma Gandhi mm. and Martin Luther King, who are also non-violent activists. And uh, by that, I mean that they stood up and asked for what they want, but they didn't do it with violence. In fact, the opposite. They did it with compassion. And um, so Mahatma Gandhi was the one who said that actually violence is not, doesn't begin with, a, with an action. It begins with a thought. Right. He was part of this, uh, this doctrine that they call ahimsa in India. Ahimsa, exactly. Ahimsa is about having you know, non-violence in the mind. So not jumping in our mind to blame, to attack, to make wrong. As soon as, as, soon as we feel an uncomfortable feeling, any uncomfortable feeling, we have been conditioned to look outside ourselves for something to blame, to make wrong. And... In truth, it's not out there. It's in here. I love this story by Thich Nhat Hanh. You may have heard it. There's uh, about the monk who was looking for a beautiful place to meditate. So he comes down to a lake and there's a canoe there. And he thinks, oh, I'm going to go out in the middle of the lake, sit in my canoe and have a good meditate. Nothing will disturb me out there. I will be completely undisturbed. So he jumps in the canoe. He paddles out to the middle of the lake. He's sitting there with his eyes closed, having a wonderful meditate. He's feeling just fantastic. And all of a sudden, bunk, a boat rams into his boat. And before he opens his eyes, he feels all this anger well up inside him. He's just about to go, ooh, too banged into my boat. And he opens his eyes and sees there's nobody in the other boat. There's nobody there. And in that moment, Thich Nhat Hanh says, that monk became enlightened because he realized mm. that anger does not come from the outside. <laughs> it 
comes from within. And so That's I'm responsible for my reaction. I'm responsible for my response. And I can either react unconsciously or I can respond consciously. So if I was to stop and take a breath, just at that moment when the boat banged into my boat, and I went, <sighs> and connect with myself first, I would choose a response that met my needs rather than react with an unconscious response that may well not meet our, my needs. And that's very true with anger because we often get anger, don't we? We feel angry with the people who are closest to us and the ones we love the most, the ones we most want to be connected to. But what happens? We let our anger out like it was nothing to do with us. Almost, you know, I couldn't help it. I just had to do it. <laughs> I had to shout at you. So sorry about that. But this is the one I love, who I've now pushed away with my angry blame, labels, evaluations, all these things that make them wrong and make them either want to fight or flight, run away or, or attack me. In one case, you can have a type of communication that has, that has the effect of love and peace. Mm -hmm. In one case, it has the outcome of fear and anger. What defines the road you take? Great question. Simple answer, needs. Universal human needs. Very basically, if our needs are met, we are going to feel happy, comfortable. My need for comfort, my need for food, my need for warmth, my need for connection, need for love. If these needs are met, there's a whole list that we, we all have. It's one of the things that makes us human. Um, isn't that interesting, actually, that we, we all share those things? Whether you're an Eskimo or a pygmy, you still get afraid. You still mm. feel hunger. You still have these feelings. And the interesting thing is we were conditioned and trained to believe that other people make us feel the way we feel, which is a complete fallacy. Nobody can get inside me or you and pull those strings that allow those different chemicals to, you know, be squizzed into your blood and that then makes you feel a certain way. Nobody is doing that from the outside. It's all an inside job. So... How come um, we're all in this collective trance? <laughs> well, that's a great question and another big question. Now, let me come back to that in a minute. We'll yeah, just right. talk about needs right now. And the needs, when they're met, then we're going to feel good. And when they're not met, we don't feel good. We feel fear, sad, despair, anger, jealous, depressed, all those uncomfortable feelings. And all of those feelings, when they arise, it's like a flag going up saying, I've got an unmet need. I need help. In fact, you could kind of boil down everything that comes out of our mouth. Marshall said this, is everything that comes out of our mouth is either a please or a thank you. We're either saying, please, can you help me? Or thank you for making my life more wonderful. Celebration. Whoopee. We're either celebrating or we're mourning. That's the two things we do all the time. Mm. We're either saying, great, this is super duper. I just love it so much. Or, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm missing something. I'm needing something. I'm longing for something. And if I could just even just move a little bit closer to meeting that need, I would feel better. So that's the fundamental basic thing of what makes us go this way or that way. Does that answer your question? Yeah, and, and I, I've done a little bit of NVC myself years and years ago. I actually went through a, I had a mediation done with, inside my family with a facilitator. And I remember learning this small protocol of nonviolent communication instead of the usual thing we do, which is you are like this, da 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 da, redirecting towards the I. Mm -hmm. I feel this way. So the little protocol was like this. It was, when you do this, I feel like that. 
in order to feel like this, I would need that. And I remember there was also an emphasis on which adjective you actually choose. Because some, there's a lot of importance put on the language in nonverbal communication because um, some adjectives have an inherent blaming connotation to them and some are more uh, objective, like I'm sad is really me, but I feel betrayed already has this thing in it. Yes, it's not so much adjectives, it's just that the words that we are um, using as feelings are not feelings. Very often mm. they're thoughts. In your example, they're betrayed. So actually, betrayed is not a feeling. If you're feeling betrayed, if you think you're betrayed, yes, you're feeling some strong feelings, I'm sure. You're probably feeling very sad and very uh, frustrated maybe and hurt, definitely hurt. Um, but it's not betrayed because that's what you think somebody is doing to you. And you can't feel betrayed by yourself. You need somebody else to be there to betray you. Yep. And uh, it's the same with rejected. I can't feel rejected by myself. I need somebody to reject me. I can't feel misunderstood because I need somebody to misunderstand me. So these tell me actually not my feelings but my needs. If I think that I'm betrayed, I'm probably needing trust. If I think that I'm rejected, I'm mm. probably needing connection. If I think I'm misunderstood, I'm probably needing understanding and so on. So we make this big mistake of saying these words are feelings and then we're very surprised at the reaction they engender. So, well, you know, if I say to you, I feel rejected by you and you don't think you're rejecting me, you'll probably say, I'm not rejecting you. <laughs> well, actually, I was, I was sharing my feeling, you know, I was trying to be vulnerable, so I, that's not what I want to hear. Actually, I want to hear, oh, you poor thing, or oh, I'm sad to hear that, or something like that. But no, you defended yourself, and you talked about yourself, not about me, so there's no empathy there. And uh, I'm left feeling even more alone. <laughs> so, you know, uh, this, I think it's really important for us to learn to say true feelings. And if we're saying what we think, to be aware of the consequences. Because what we say, when we say we think something, everybody has different opinions. So it's very likely that yours will be different from mine. Thoughts. But if we talk about feelings, then that's the common language. Feelings and needs, that's what makes us all human. We all have the same feelings, we all have the same mm. needs. And that's what connects us. So if I talk about my feelings and my needs, and then I listen to you and I hear your feelings and your needs, there's much better chance of us connecting and resolving our differences than if I tell you what's wrong with you or what I think about you, what you should do or shouldn't do. <laughs> Very true. All those things, yeah. Very true. Uh, you said twice already in this conversation the terms expressing honestly and empathy. Hmm. Could you develop a bit? Seems like they're core principles of NVC. They are, yes. Um, so if we look at communication right now, I'm talking to you. I'm expressing myself. And you're receiving me. You're listening to me. So... That's the two parts that are very obvious in verbal communication. But there's another part which is going on at the same time, which is our communication with ourselves. So just before I open my mouth, fast as a flash, I'm actually thinking there's a thought that goes through my head about what I'm about to say, what's coming out of my mouth. It happens so fast I'm not aware of it, but it is. I'm connecting with myself before I express myself. And I can slow that down if I want. And you two are listening to me and when I'm telling you something that maybe you think is interesting to you, might make your life more easier, you might want to learn this, the first thing you do is you check it out against your past experience. How do you do that? Well, you have to go inside and communicate with yourself. You have to ask yourself, is what Dorset just said true for me? Compare with my past experience, compare with my past life. You know, or, or, or do, or, you know, I mean, that people call it the bullshit detec detector, the radar mm. that's going on all the time. We all have it. We're always looking out for 
Is this news false or is it true? Is this uh, going to work or not? Has this person got some ulterior motive for telling me this or do they genuinely want to help? These sort of things. So expressing ourselves honestly, we can do it to each other and to ourselves and we can use these four elements of nonviolent communication to do so. We can also use those four elements in listening to another person, expressing ourselves honestly and communicating with ourselves. So if I if you like, I can go over these three, these three modes of communication. Yes, please. Okay, yeah. expressing ourselves honestly, connecting with ourselves, and hearing the other. So, if I'm expressing myself honestly, let's start with that one. There are four elements to um, MVC. Observation, feelings, needs, and request. So, first of all, I'm going to make an observation about, let's say we're, we've got a bit of a conflict going on. Something started the conflict. We call that the stimulus. It's not the cause, but it's the stimulus. Because the cause is our unmet need. That's mm. why I feel uncomfortable. But the stimulus was the thing that started it off. So maybe I, I'm in a shop and I look out the window and I see somebody bang into my car. That's a stimulus. Oh, somebody banged into my car. Now, the next thing is, how do I consciously want to respond to that? So I ask myself, first of all, how do I feel? Oh, annoyed, angry, somebody's damaged my car. What are my needs? Well, actually quite a few. My needs are for, ah, Oh, this is, I'm thinking, I'm telling myself, this is going to cost me money. I need, I need some help with that paying for this, to the car to be fixed. I need justice. I want this person to pay for that. Um, I want to understand what happened because I'm a bit confused as to why he hit me. Um, so, yeah. I've got a, a fair few. I'm, I'm afraid. I'm afraid he might just drive away and not do and, 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 and not take responsibility for hitting my car. So what do I do? I run outside. And then I have to remind myself, oh, do I want to connect with this person? Is that my intention? Or do I want to push them away? If I run out there and call them names and say they're very stupid because they've just banged into my car, I'm very likely to sabotage my need for connection. So, instead, I'll connect with myself. I'm kind of mixing this all up together, aren't I? Mm. But it, it, giving an example will show you how it all works together. So, first of all, I want to express myself, but before I do, I'm going to connect with myself. What am I feeling? Annoyed. What am I needing? I'm needing some understanding, some justice, some financial um, security. <laughs> Uh, okay, that'll do. And what's my request to myself? I need to go out there and talk to this person who's just banged into my car. Mm. Okay, that's my connecting with myself using those four ingredients. Now I'm going to go out there and talk to this person, but I'm not going to go and do something unconscious like tell them how stupid they are. I am going to use my MVC again to say something which will help me get my needs met. Those needs that I already identified when I connected with myself. So now I'll go out there and I'll say to that person, I see you hit my car. Observation. And notice I said the observation without any evaluation. I didn't hmm. say, you hit my car because you're such a lousy driver. <laughs> because, yep. you know, 12 people might not agree that the person was a lousy driver. Maybe something happened to distract him and that's why he hit the car and it just wasn't his fault just a fact so let's just start with the facts that we can both agree on me and the other person there's no dispute there's no there's no kind of gray area about the fact that he hit my car so i can say that and he's going to agree with me yes i did hit your car unless he didn't in which case he's going to say so and we can sort out our conflict right at that level at the observation level. But let's just suppose for this example, he did make, hit my car. I said, you hit my car. 
He agrees with me. So we've got this common ground that we're working from, the stimulus, that, and we've got connection because we both agree that's what happened. Okay, we've got the observation now, I'm going to express my feeling. When I saw you hit my car, I felt, I feel, I'm, and actually here's the thing that I might not come out with right away, I don't come out with my anger, because just saying I'm angry, the other person's liable to hear I'm angry with you, and hear it as an attack. So what I usually do is try to go under the anger to what's the feeling under the anger. And the, un and the thing under, uh, what's under the anger here is fear and sadness. I'm feeling sad. I'm feeling a bit disappointed. I'm feeling, and I'm feeling a bit annoyed, frustrated. Frustrated is a better word because I'm thinking, I'm telling myself this is going to be a hassle. I'm going to have to fix the car. So anyway, I go out there and I say, I'm feeling... I see you hit my car and I'm a bit upset. And that's easier to hear than I'm angry with you. I'm feeling upset. And, uh, and I'd really like to understand what happened. So that's uh, feeling confused and needing understanding. I'm wondering if you can help me. My request, can you help me? So um, when you learn MVC, actually, you end up doing these things kind of automatically because they just become a habit. But at first, it sounds really quite difficult. Oh, you don't talk like this normally. That's true. That's kind of because it's classic MVC, but after a while it becomes colloquial, which we where we don't, we don't follow this A, B, C, D pattern quite so religiously. In fact, hardly mm. at all. It doesn't have to be done in that order. It doesn't have to be done with these words. In fact, I recommend to my advanced students that they drop the word feeling and they drop the word need <laughs> because they are, we don't use those words normally in everyday conversation, not very much. We might use feel a bit, but we never use that. Human needs, universal needs, no, we don't use that. The only kind of need we do use is that more like a, a negative connotation, being needy, which is kind of like being dependent on others to meet your needs. And that has a negative connotation, so I often explain that when I'm teaching MVC. It's not that. These are universal needs that everybody has, and actually it's a great idea to know what they are, and it's also a great idea to ask for them to be met when they're unmet. In such mm. a way that it doesn't hurt people or push them away, but just say, you know, like, I could really do with some help here. That's a need. Help. Would you be willing to help me? That's a request. And it gives people choice. They can either help you or not, depending on whether they can do it joyfully. I only want people to do things for me joyfully. I don't want to do things, I don't want you to do something for me if you have resentment in your heart that uh, I'm making you do this against your will or that you should do this because it's your duty or you shouldn't do this because only bad people do that. This was Dorset Campbell Ross on nonviolent communication. I hope you enjoyed the episode. In the next episode, we'll present the second half of this conversation where Dorset presents more on empathy and listening and in which we do a role play. In this situation, how would you present the problem? In this situation, how would you speak to your employer, or partner, etc.? I hope you'll join in and listen to the second part of this interview. And meanwhile, continue to plant the beautiful seeds of our future. The Future Seeds podcast is a project that is supported by its community of listeners. If you like the show and what it stands for, I invite you to head to www.futureseeds.news where you can support the show for just $2 a month, be part of the Future Seeds community, connect with its amazing members and speakers, and enable this podcast to thrive. I thank you for your time and hope you enjoy the show and its exploration of alternative solutions to the world's greatest challenges.